now from the Pope John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Welcome to the World Over Live. We have a blockbuster of a show for you tonight. Author, syndicated columnist, and former presidential candidate Pat J. Buchanan is here to discuss his latest book, Suicide of a Superpower, Will America Survive to 2025? And Why the Demise of Faith is So Destructive to a Nation. And later, what is that I hear? Author and Academy Award winning screenwriter William Peter Blatty is here just in time for All Hallows Eve to talk about the new 40th anniversary edition of his iconic 1971 novel, The Exorcist. He'll tell us about the heart of the novel so many miss. Get your calls and emails in early. You can reach us at 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S. and internationally, 205-271-2980. Or drop us an email, worldover at EWTN.com. To get us started, here's the brief news from the world over this week. Religious leaders from around the world met in Assisi on Thursday for a Vatican-organized interreligious pilgrimage for peace. The event marked the 25th anniversary of the first such event organized by Blessed John Paul II. In his remarks, Pope Benedict drew attention to two forms of violence in the world today. The, quote, reckless cruelty of terrorism and its exploitation of religious belief and violence arising from the attempted elimination of God. The Pope cited 20th century totalitarianism and concentration camps as vivid il illustrations. Today, he said, godless materialism produces similar threats noting that violence that arises from drug trafficking that threatens to destroy our young people, as one example. By design and distinctively absent from the Assisi gathering was any appearance of interfaith prayer, which was criticized by many Catholics and others during the 1986 Assisi event. And the leader of the Maronite Catholic Church warned that the wave of unrest caused by the Arab Spring could turn into a winter of civil war and minority oppression. At a New York press conference this past week, Patriarch Bershare Arai of Antioch said that although the Arab Spring holds much promise, its leaders must adopt a separation between religion and state, as is the case in his native Lebanon. Failure to do so, he argued, could lead to civil war, as in Iraq or usher in regimes that are even more fundamentalist. Patriarch Rai was in the U.S. for a pastoral visit. The United States is home to nearly 80,000 Maronite Catholics. And former British Member of Parliament Anne Widdencombe also drew attention to persecuted Christians this week. She criticized her government for overlooking widespread threats to Christians when considering Britain's foreign aid policy. In a speech on Saturday to international Catholic charity Aid to the Church in Need, Widdencombe noted that the UK doubled its aid to Pakistan despite one of its Christian citizens being sentenced to death for blasphemy. Meanwhile, she noted that the UK recently cut its aid to Malawi after two homosexual men were sentenced to 14 years of hard labor. Widdencombe asked rhetorically whether Christians were entitled to the same kind of protection. And on Wednesday, a leading U.S. bishop testified to Congress about the grave threats to religious liberty. Right here in the United States, Bishop William Lorry of Bridgeport raised concern to a House Judiciary Subcommittee about recent government actions restricting religious freedom. He pointed to the Obama administration's support for same-sex marriage rights and its characterization of the Defense of Marriage Act as an act of bigotry. Lori also decried mandated contraceptive coverage for health insurance, and most recently, the denial of a federal grant to a bishop-run Catholic agency charged with helping victims of human trafficking. The reason for the denial? The agency's policy of not providing abortion services or contraceptives. Bishop Lori labeled the government's required conditions for the grant program illegal. In all, he said, the recent government actions are grim validations of the need for urgent and concerted action. He further urged the backing of three bills in Congress designed to secure 
religious liberty against the aforementioned federal threats. And as Eurozone leaders spent the week attempting to head off a debt crisis and the collapse of the Euro, a Vatican Council has suggested that they consider an extraordinary overhaul of the global financial system, including the creation of a worldwide financial authority. At a press conference Monday, the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace released an 18-page document suggesting that such an authority, which would include taxing authority, would help create a free, stable world economic and financial system. It further argues that the current economic downturn has revealed selfishness, collective greed, and hoarding of goods on a grand scale. These problems, the Council says, the free market system alone cannot correct. We'll unpack all of this later in the show. Stay tuned for that. And many of you in our viewing family have been writing and emailing about whether the world over will continue broadcasting from the John Paul II Cultural Center here in D.C. because you wanted to visit. As you might know, the Knights of Columbus recently acquired this building. The supposition was that we would continue on here. Well, we received word this week that the Knights have decided they need all the space and therefore the world over has to leave this facility. I'm sure they have wonderful plans for the space. Barring any changes, December will mark our final broadcasts from the JP2 Cultural Center. And I want to thank personally the Cultural Center Board, the Dioceses of Detroit and Washington, and the Knights who allowed us to use this facility for the last nearly four years. But we will find another home. Keep us in your prayers and uh, let us know if you know of anything in D.C. And we'll keep you posted on our progress. Up next, Pat Buchanan is here. Is America in decline? And is the decrease of faith partially to blame? We'll also discuss news of the week and take your calls when the World Over Live continues. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. My first guest is no stranger to this program. He's an author, nationally syndicated columnist, and a former candidate for president of the United States three times over. He's a regular contributor to the McLaughlin Group on PBS as well as MSNBC. And he joins us tonight to talk about his latest book, Suicide of a Superpower. Will America Survive 2025? It's been a while. Welcome back to the program. Pat Buchanan. Pat, great to see, great you, to see you. Let, you know, I, I want to get into this and then some news of the week. Sure. This book, this almost feels like the death of the West continued. I guess we're still dying. <laughs> what, 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 tell me why you wanted to write this book and felt it was important for it to come out now. Well, you know, I got a sense, you know, I, that question I was asked by everybody along the rope line was, Pat, what happened to the country we grew up in? Mm -hmm. And I tried to bring together all the things that are happening to the country, why I believe they're happening, and whether our situation is really reversible now. Mm -hmm. In 1979, of course, I was like a lot of Americans, Jimmy Carter, you lost Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and, and the, the economy was down and everybody was demoralized and Euro-communism was on the move, and we elected Ronald Reagan, and we turned it around. I just am not sure we can turn this around because I think the problems I describe are beyond politics. Really, and and there, you you do and you, this is really an, a diagnosis of the entire society. It is cultural. It is uh, you, you you talk about faith. You talk yeah. about then all the foreign policies, uh, immigration. You leave no politics, stone unturned in this right. book. Um, and it's as you can see, it's not a. This isn't something you tossed off in an afternoon, <laughs> Pat. How many pages we got here? Almost five hundred pages. Right. It took three years of effort on and off and taking things out. Maybe I shouldn't say this. Maybe I, they're not going to like this. And. Got it all together and sent it out. Last political will and testament. Uh, is that is this the last type of book like uh, this? That like do? I think so. You know, I did. You've, you know, you've warned them as much as you can. Look, I did. As I've told people, look, somebody wrote a book called 
So, you know, um, state of emergency, day of reckoning, and death of the West is not someone you want to have at a barbecue on Saturday <laughs> afternoon. So you want to but get reinvited is, to the barbecue. Now we got suicide of a superpower. <laughs> well, and, it, and it's, it's it, I mean, the fact is, as you read the book, you do see and you point out stark statistics that undergird mm -hmm. your argument right. that we really are in, a, in a, a very serious moment in American history. And why I say, let me say, why I say it's irreversible and the religious argument. You know, religion is the fundamental basis of ethics and morality, and we've had a moral consensus in this country. We did, mm -hmm. all the way from the Revolution all the way up to the 1960s. But why is it important to people who may not be religious at all, Pat? Because when the religion dies, the moral consensus dies, the moral code is thrown over, the ethics die, you've got the privatization of morality, mm -hmm. everybody does what he wants. And I think that leads to cultural and social suicide for a nation. Mm -hmm. Look at the decomposition of the family, the illegitimacy rate, and as one of the folks I quote in there, you know, the illegitimacy rate is directly correlated to the drug rate, the crime rate, the dropout rate, the incarceration rate. All these things are happening. Secondly, when there's a real conflict between militant secularism and a fading Christianity, these two systems are behind the cultural wars that are now constantly mm -hmm. in our but, society. But in, in the book, you say something that, that, that I want to focus mm -hmm. attention on. You say conservatives lost the culture wars. How can you say that, Pat? It looks like they're, I mean, the pro, you, when you look at the pro-life polling, you've got young people, 59% mm -hmm. saying that this is, abortion mm -hmm. is morally wrong. Uh, the older generations, right. do older generations disagree with that? They, they, have, a, well, they have a much lower number. Uh, I mean, it's, well, there well, are Irving, bright spots. Irving Crystal here. said in 1992, after my speech, to the Republican Houston Convention. Mm -hmm. I regret to inform Pat Buchanan <laughs> the culture war is over. We lost. Uh -huh. I mean, we really haven't been able to roll back Roe v. Wade. 50 million abortions. You take a look at the pornography and stuff coming over the Internet. You take a look at the, the young people in mm -hmm. terms of their beliefs. Something like 25% have no religion whatsoever. Yeah. And the mainstream Protestant denominations are dying. Mm -hmm. And I've got the crisis of Catholicism in there. Yeah. Look, it is a tough situation. This is not the day of Pius the Twelfth, Raymond. Yeah, I, I've noticed. I've noticed, Pat. <laughs> In the book, you do. You have a chapter called "Crisis of Catholicism." I want to run down just some of these statistics. Yeah. Uh, one in three Catholics reared in the faith have left the church. Uh, one in ten American adults have fallen away. This is really interesting. Uh, you quote a father, Joseph Sirba, uh, yeah. and he writes, "If one excludes immigrants and converts from the mm -hmm. calculations, the Catholic Church has lost to other religions or to no religion at all, 35.4 percent, more than a third mm -hmm. of its adherents." Let's see, those are the statistics of the decline of a mighty faith, and one that, frankly, in the 1940s and 50s was perhaps the leading moral authority in the United States. I can remember when the priests up at Mass at Blessed Sacrament, the parish mm -hmm. up the road here, they got up and said, The Moon is Blue is a condemned film with Bill Holden. It's being played at our Avalon <laughs> Theater. We want it out of there. And they were marching down there with signs, and it was gone. Mm -hmm. And look what they're doing to the church now in Hollywood. Do you think that was because there was a clear moral code and there was agreement on this, these are the things we believe, these are the things we expect of those who are members of the Catholic right. faith, and we're, we're a force. And we're our, we are a force. After World War II, these veterans came out of the, you know, the horrible times they'd gone through. Converts were up. It was enormous. Schools were being built one a week or something like right. that. Look, we had four and a half million parochial school students. It's now down to one and a half million, even though we've added a hundred million to the population yeah. since then. I yeah, know it's, 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 it's staggering it's when you step back and look. Uh, do you see, though, you, you mention in here that uh, the triumphal faith, the church militant, right. uh, is on the wane. But then you mention a few examples well, in recent days. Tell us about the signs of hope. There's well, got to be some are, hope here, Pat. Well, I, there was the battle on Obamacare and uh, when a lot of the, the, the Catholic bishops and others said, look, we're going to come out against this thing mm -hmm. if we don't get this particular Stupac amendment. Of course, right. Stupac went south on us. Yeah. But the, and there are other things, I think a lot, some of the bishops are really standing up strong. The bishop up there and uh, Archbishop in New York has. Archbishop Dolan, yeah. Even, uh, I guess, Cardinal World now, I guess it is, yeah. right? He stood yeah. up occasionally. And look at, I think, one third of the bishops denounced Notre Dame yeah. for giving a uh, honorary degree to the President of the United States in about the fourth or fifth months of its administration, 
That's a, that's a change. That's a, they're mm -hmm. still covering up the crucifixes at Georgetown, I think, mm -hmm. when the president shows up, yeah. you know. But I think there are signs of a certain militancy. And frankly, uh, when you get to the point we're at, all you got to do, you just turn around and at least start fighting. Yeah. Well, it seems there is a little bit of that fight. I mean, you mentioned some of the figures uh, in right. the book. You talk about Archbishop Dolan. You talk about uh, Bill Donahue and people right. like him who are uh, taking on these egregious examples right. of Catholic bashing and Christian well, bashing well, in the Bill public. Well, Bill Donahue, I've got a lot of quotes and a lot of material there I got from Bill Donahue, mm -hmm. but, but Archbishop Burke and some of the others. Mm -hmm. And there are some top people, really, and they deserve some recognition and some support mm -hmm. rather than just bemoaning things. Yeah. But without a renaissance of faith, without a re rediscovered and renewed faith, can you rebuild this thing? Can you? Con well, is there I anything said, worth conserving, as you mentioned a, a few weeks ago in a column? The remnant is worth conserving. But as I said, the problems here are not going to be solved by Pat Buchanan or even a Ronald Reagan. I think mm -hmm. we need a St. Paul, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Or you need a great awakening again in this country and awareness of where we're going. And it better come pretty soon mm -hmm. because I think the country is going downhill. And when the common faith and ethics and morality go, the, the society dis disintegrates, it breaks down, mm -hmm. and everybody is at war with everybody. It's almost the war of all against all. There's yeah. that quote of T.S. And you know, uh, some of the poets you read when you yeah. were younger, T.S. Eliot. Keats and T.S. Yeah, Eliot, you've got yeah, them here. Exactly, and, uh, and uh, Yeats and T.S. Eliot right. and Schultz and Eatson and the others, right. and Belloc and these folks, you realize, Hey, those fellows they told me to read back there in high school and college <laughs> might have had something to say I should have listened to. Yeah. And you go back and read them, and T what did T.S. Eliot said? He was asked by Stephen Spender, who I believe became, was a, pretty close to the Communist Party, mm -hmm. what do you see in the future? He said, internecine warfare, people killing one another in the streets. Look, what, look at London last summer. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, uh, they've lost, I think there are more Muslims go to mosque on Friday than Anglicans go to church yeah. on Sunday. Is, is, are, are the Islamics filling the void? Because there's yeah. a faith void, obviously, when you see these mainline churches, you, right. you chronicle it in the book. When they start collapsing, there is this emptiness. Right. The Islamics are a very, it's a, it's a male-led right. religion. They're very aggressive. They are very uh, uh, faithful. Again, Belloc said in 1938, the year of Munich, he looked south. I mean, everyone was focused on the Nazis mm -hmm. and the British and the Russians and the rest. He said, our old ancient adversary is going to rise again. I think Islam is rising in a sense of it is militant. It is increasingly devoted to the faith. It is looking to Europe mm -hmm. as decadent, dying, waiting to be taked over, taken over. You've got a quote in there by Houari Boumediene, who was the president of Algeria. Mm -hmm. He said, we are going to conquer Europe through the wombs of our women. And every single Western nation in Europe has a population that is aging, shrinking, and dying. And they're going to need more people. And where are they going to come from? An Islamic world whose populations are exploding. So I think gradually, I think Europe is going to be lost to Islamism or the Islamic faith. And it's already happening. And uh, these folks are not assimilating. And they're not being acculturated, if you will, into those yeah. societies. You talk in the book, you, you do, you have a chapter on immigration and uh, mm -hmm. you, you take to task those who have come uh, without going through the normal right. channels and, and naturalizing right. themselves. Um, but you, you, it, it, there, there seems to be some conflict here because in recent articles that I've read, uh, I, here's an article I just pulled today. It says Hispanics, U.S. Mm. Hispanics, this is from NPR, so consider the source, <laughs> but it says U.S. Hispanics choose churches outside of Catholicism. But what in the piece, when you read it, it says Latinos are saving American Christianity because you have the, popul mm. the native population right. collapsing or drifting away. The Hispanics are coming in right. and they are revivifying or at least holding these churches. Aren't they doing what you call for in the book, which is solidify a faith. You need a right. solid base to build a, a, right. a, a culture upon. But uh, the number of abortions per woman in Mexico and by, among Hispanics in the United States exceeds those of the native population here in the U.S. 51% mm -hmm. of Hispanic kids are born out of wedlock. They're predominant in the gang. The point is that, that what Heather McDonald in there calls the, uh, the myth of the redemptive Hispanic. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. is not happening, but I'll tell you what's happening is they are being converted to the secular faith of the country, uh -huh. even though they may have come in here as nominal Catholics. But mm -hmm. I think the Catholic Church, in terms of the 
intensity of its faith is in deep trouble in Latin America as well. Evangelicals mm -hmm. have made tremendous inroads there. Right. But even the evangelicals, and uh, I think they're the young people, I think even the young evangelicals, others, are very supportive of gay marriage. Yeah. Now, there's, there's this marriage. piece from NPR, it says, uh, why most uh, Latinos leave Catholicism? Pew researchers found. Mm -hmm. There's another reason. Uh, New Life member, this is a woman who, right. who was a, a Catholic, she went right. to this evangelical church. She says that in Mexico, where her parents are from, she could never have made the switch. Her culture, her family wouldn't let her. But things are different in the United States, she says. It's more open. We can go to different churches or visit many churches. It's what they call church shopping, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting that... Well, uh, when, I, <clears throat> when the faith dies, the culture dies, the civilization mm -hmm. dies, and the people begin to die. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the phones. Joe from New York. You're on The World Over Live with Pat Buchanan. What's your question? Hi, Raymond. It's a good show. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Buchanan, I was wondering if uh, abortion had anything to do with the decline and the suicide of America as a superpower. Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you. I'll, I, I'll, I do. Well, there's been 50 million abortions in the United States since mm -hmm. Roe v. Wade. That certainly had to do with the, uh, mm -hmm. I think it is a first psychologically that must have a devastating impact upon women who have had the abortions and men who have condoned them. But secondly, and just in terms of the population, the native born white population of this country is stagnant. And by 2020, there will be more, I think there'll be a larger share of white folks over 65 than under 21, I believe. Mm -hmm. But figures like that, and so that population is stagnant, and it's declining as a share of the American population. And the folks coming in to take their place uh, are not, fr frankly, do not have this, the educational skills or aptitudes or the professional skills or the language skills. So you've, that's partly responsible for basically the economic decline, the decline in test scores. Mm -hmm. So all these things work together. I think, uh, you know, I think the, the caller's got a good point. Yeah, it's a holistic, it's a holistic sure, uh, all together. And yeah. as you travel through Europe, you know, I was in Italy, uh, I don't know, several yeah. months ago. When you look around, there are no children. They say there are more dogs on the streets than children. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. No, and, exactly. and that's, that's troubling. But if it, you go up to the Ban Luz, where the Arabs and Muslims are, lots of children up there. Yeah. No, it's, it's, mm. it's fascinating. I want to get into something while we talk sure. about this. Uh, just across the road here at Catholic University of America, some Muslim students are complaining to a D.C. human rights board that they're being discriminated against. And the mm -hmm. source of their complaint is this. The official allegations say that Catholic University of America does not provide space as other universities do for the many daily prayers Muslim students must make, for forcing them instead to find temporary classrooms where they're often surrounded by Catholic symbols like crucifixes that are incongruous to their religion right. and offensive. Well, uh, <laughs> what do you make of that? I know how we would have dealt with it in the 50s. <laughs> okay, let's not go there, Pat. <laughs> no. I read right from the beginning that biography of yours. I know how you no, bloody knuckles no, at the end no, of the argument. No, I meant they would have been right over GW. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> transfer, a one exactly. transfer of papers. But this is yeah, a, yeah. We, we're interesting, we, we are floating into an interesting moment here where yeah. Catholic institutions mm -hmm. are now running up against these newly created laws and being right. seen and interpreted as discriminatory bodies, right. whether it be about uh, right. uh, uh, the uh, you know gay students, whether it be Muslim students, mm. or sometimes just health services you're providing. Right. Isn't this a moment? Can the mm. Catholic Church rise to this moment is the question. Well, I, mean. I think the Catholic Church is, uh, becomes, I think, a countercultural institution, mm -hmm. clearly because it is, this isn't the, Christianity is not the dominant faith of this country in a sense in terms of the elites and the academy and the mm -hmm. entertainment industry and the rest. Mm -hmm. I think it's basically what you have to do is offer resistance. But do I see the tide turning? No, this is why I say it's moving in the wrong direction when now, I mean, demands, it used to be you do what you want in your institutions as long as you don't try to Christianize you know, public schools. Right. And now it's moving the other way, I think, with mm -hmm. the Catholic and Christian institutions under fire and under pressure. Yeah, religious freedom. You had Bishop Laurie testifying on the right. Hill the other day. Right. Um, it's troubling. It's amazing. Let's go to Peter from New York. Go ahead, Peter. What's your question? Uh, Mr. Buchanan, um, I'm wondering if uh, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan's white paper that he wrote uh, in 1970, I believe, about the demise of the black family mm -hmm. uh, fit into your book. And 
you might remember that he was roundly criticized by academia, the media, and his right. colleagues, and he probably never, that I know of, spoke on that theme again, but he proved to be prophetic. Uh, yeah. Did you have anything, any comments yeah. in your book about that? It was, I have, I do have, uh, that, that paper's mentioned, it was 1965, mm -hmm. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Pat Moynihan, he was a White House colleague of mine. Oh, that's right. And a friend of mine, and other, one of his other books, Pandemonium, uh, I describe in there, which is the capital of hell and Dante's Inferno. <laughs> he talks about, you know, the ethnic tribal right. struggles that are coming over. Right. Coming. But the point he made is the black uh, illegitimacy rate was an astonishing 23 percent, he said, in 1965. Hmm. The national rate in the United States is now 41 percent. The white rate is 28 percent. The Hispanic is 51 percent. And 71% of black kids mm. are born out of wedlock, many of them to gals who have dropped out of high school and they got no father in the home. And how are those kids going to have any kind of shot? They are really rec ready recruits for the drug gangs and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So that's, it just shows the decline, the, the astonishing social decline and decomposition, Raymond, mm -hmm. which I think is one, res one, of the, it's one of the results of the decline of faith. Mm -hmm. Because, you know... The black folks are the most churched folks in America, almost. Yeah. Yeah, I want to talk for a moment, shift off of this just a little right. bit. Um, we're getting a lot of emails, and I can't get to all of them, but I'll try. Um, they're asking your take on this current crop of GOP candidates. You ran for president. Right. What do you make? Let's just talk of the top three contenders now. Right. Uh, first, Herman Cain, who's at the top of a lot of the national right. polls, though he's coming in number two in these early primary states. So what chance does he really have with his organization? His problem is that uh, Herman did not realize that he would be right up there with the front runners, so he's not organized. He hasn't raised any money. Mm -hmm. He's been out doing debates. He's doing a nice book tour like right. I have. Right. And I think his problem is, he's even if he won early primaries, he doesn't have the legs to go mm -hmm. the distance. And there's another problem he's got, which is the problem I had in 1996 is we're in, the, if you will, the Western Conference, and we got about six different other teams in right. there. And Mitt is in the Eastern Conference, and yeah. he's got Huntsman against him, who's at 1%. Yeah. So I think that uh, he's going to find, Citizen Kane is going to find that, that his side of the thing is cut up pretty badly. <laughs> and I don't think, I think Mitt, if Mitt, if I were Mitt, I'd get out into Iowa and wrap this thing up by finishing him off in the first, uh, if he wins that, he wins New mm -hmm. Hampshire and it's all over. And what about Mitt Romney? We, we have a number of emails here, people yeah. saying, uh, what does Mr. Buchanan think of the Mormon controversy? Uh, you know, they're saying, I'm, you know. I'm, I met the pastor in a green room. Oh, that's right. You were sitting next to him during that faith and Well, no, I wasn't there. I was in the green room over oh. at NBC and he oh, came I in see. after he'd had his big day and he said, Pat Buchanan, you're one of my heroes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Pastor, how are you? Uh, the, I think that uh, the pastor used a term, a cult, which brings to mind Jim Jones stirring the Kool-Aid, right. which is grossly unfair, I think, mm -hmm. given the fact that the Mormon faith has produced some fine folks. It's the fourth faith in the country, mm -hmm. and it is one of the fastest rising. But there's no doubt about it. Three-fourths, I believe, of Baptist pastors believe it is, quote, a cult. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they, because the Book of Mormon comes well after Revelation, well, direct Revelation this guy, ended. Th this pastor also <laughs> happens to believe we're a cult or well, cultists here, well, listen, Pat. I've been in the South before. Yeah. <laughs> you ran through there once or I've twice. I've been to Bob Jones University three times, oh, you know. But, but they were very nice to me, but they yeah. were, you know, I was a curiosity. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, like, a, like a guy in a specimen yeah, That's glass. one of them right up there. What, yeah. <laughs> what, about, what about Mitt Romney and the way he's moved? I mean, when you saw, I saw a clip on this morning on one of the morning shows. You have him saying, you know, I'm all for abortion and this yeah. is fantastic. We've got to protect a woman's right. And then you flip it. I'm 100% pro-life. Well, Does that John Huntsman's father said, look, I supported him when he ran for the Senate as a liberal in Massachusetts. I supported him when he ran for governor as a moderate. And I've supported him when he ran for president as a conservative. So Mitt has clearly moved. And that's the one problem he's got. And it's the problem he's got with the Tea Party is people think he is inauthentic, that he's very smooth and mm -hmm. polished, but he will say what he has to say. To, to get nominated and to become president of the United States. And I think there's a, uh, unless there's been a, uh, a fairly dramatic internal conversion, which there was with Ronald Reagan on life, mm -hmm. uh, people say that, uh, that Mitt may be an opportunist. Hmm. What do you think of uh, Rick Perry? Is his candidacy done after uh, these stumbles? He's, 
He's still working on that birth certificate the last time. <laughs> yeah, he keeps saw. talking about Donald Trump and the well, birth certificate. I don't certificate. know why I got in. Uh, let me tell you, Perry is someone I would, I'd like but personally. Mm -hmm. When he came out, uh, you know, I like that sort of Texas bravado and the rest of it. And uh, Oh, I remember you in those chaps yeah, with, right. the, with the pistols during, uh, right. at the OK Corral at when you were okay running. At the OK Corral, right. That's right. That was a mistake probably. But, uh, <laughs> it was a great but picture. Rick, Rick Perry's problem is he lacks the discipline you need when you get out there, I mean, I'm tempted when you're on for, mm -hmm. on a book tour. Yeah. You start, I, I talked to some talk show hosts or old friends, and you start yeah. kidding around about everything right. under the sun. But he's got to be disciplined, and that's one thing that Mitt Romney does have. Yep. He's got discipline, he stays focused on message, and, and, uh, and he doesn't get off on these tangents, and I'm afraid uh, I, uh, uh, Perry had a tremendous chance and I think uh, that chance is fading. Newt Gingrich, we're getting somebody saying, what about Newt Gingrich? He's a Newt's Catholic, he's smart, why uh, not? Uh, <laughs> there's no campaign though, really. Is there a campaign? There's no campaign. He started out in the first month, he attacked Paul Ryan and he just became a laughing stock with a $500,000 account at mm -hmm. Tiffany's yeah. and a million dollar account. But what he has done very effectively in the debate, he's realized that Republicans like two things. They like other Republicans and they can't stand the media. So he praises all the other Republicans and attacks the moderator. Mm -hmm. And it works like a charm. He's done as well in the debates, uh, in, in, in those sound bites, and in other ways, as anybody in the debates, because Newt, uh, Newt is a smart fellow, but he's yeah. had the, he's been accused of, you know, not having a core, you know, core beliefs mm -hmm. and things like that. And, and moving with the tide. Yeah. Pat, our, our, my final question, I mean, the book is Suicide of a Superpower. Is there a way to reverse this or stop the suicide? Uh, I think it's, some things are baked in the cake. The revolution of the 1960s, uh, cultural, moral, social, every way. We can't go home again. And it's beyond yeah. politics to cure it. And so uh, it doesn't, frankly, it's, it's a Spenglerian book. But as I tell people asking, what are your answers there? I said, I've got some answers on fiscal and foreign policy, balancing the budget. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how to turn that around. And uh, I it, really is a moral, it really is a moral crisis at the heart uh, that ails this country. It's a religious crisis and a moral crisis. It's at the heart of what ails this country because that's, it's because with nothing holds us together. Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever, I mean, Martin Luther King, whom I criticize some, it, when he got up there, he said, I want Americans to live up to the meaning of their creed. He meant not only the Constitution, mm -hmm. but what does the Sermon on the Mount tell you about how white folks should treat black folks? Mm -hmm. And I think that was the heart of That's why many folks in the South who may not have liked Martin Luther King, I think responded to the message and said, you know, he's got a point. Mm -hmm. And we're not living up to our creed. Yeah, because he was, I mean, it, it, it sprang from his right. Christian belief and it, principle. And we right. often forget that when commemorating right. and remembering Martin Luther King. Well, in, that, in that statue, that Buddha, they got oh, a yeah, that's statue. Oh, yeah, that's a looks, a, yeah, well, it is they, appalling, really. Yeah. I, I was at that march on Washington. I was up in the, oh, really? I was up in the Lincoln Memorial. Yeah. And whatever he was, he was a very passionate people, right. full of fire and full of, tra you know, tragedy is coming to me. Yeah. And so it was a very human thing. And that looks yeah. like something, you know, Mao said, you know. Yeah, even even yeah. Maya Angelou said it's, it's, it's despicable yeah. because it was carved by a Chinese sculptor. Why couldn't they find an American, or it's better right. yet, an African-American exactly, sculptor exactly, to, to exactly, create the memorial yeah. anyway? Pat Buchanan, it's, a it's pleasure. always. Enjoy. Thank you for being here. Pat's latest, Suicide of a Superpower, Will America Survive to 2025, is available at bookstores everywhere and online at the usual outlets, which is where you're buying them these days. When we return, we'll celebrate the 40th anniversary of a landmark novel of terror and faith with the author of The Exorcist, William Peter Blatty. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. He is perhaps best known for his 1971 mega-hit novel, The Exorcist, not to mention his screenplay for the 1973 film version that earned him an Academy Award. 2011 marks, believe it or not, the 40th anniversary of the novel that brought him international acclaim. Here to tell us about the new edition of The Exorcist and the real reason he wrote that book, please welcome back to the program 
William Blatty. Hey. Great to see you. Great to see you again. Hey, yeah, it's, it's always a joy. Now, tell me, I was stunned to read that you had not read this book until just a few years ago. What was the occasion for it that? It was, well, I, I, I never reread my own work because every time I read it, I'm going to want to change something. And sometimes <laughs> change is not good, mm. you know, and it, it, it aggravates me. Uh, but about 11 years ago, I was asked to narrate the audiobook of The Exorcist for Parrot Books. We did it, by the way, in uh, <laughs> we recorded it in a hotel room in <laughs> Calabasas, and the, one of the Doobie Brothers was the sound mixer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and I was about two-thirds of the way through, and I came across a prose passage that, I mean, the rhythms were so off that I stopped the recording. And I, I broke everyone up by saying, who wrote this garbage? <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, my God, Bill, one day, uh, too bad you didn't do a second draft. I never did. I, I hmm. did a first draft because I was uh, financially uh, on my uppers at the time. Hmm. And it was nine months on this particular novel. It is, as a matter of fact, that's how I came to uh, fire my, uh, my screenplay uh, agent. That's how I made all my money, not with books. Uh -huh. uh, I, I saw him three lines down from mine at the Van Nuys, California unemployment office. Oh, God. So <laughs> he, was, he was gone. So about three weeks before I had finished yeah. the manuscript, uh, I got, remarkably, an offer to write something non-comedic hmm. for uh, Paul Newman. It was this is a screenplay. Yes, an adaptation of Calder Willingham's wonderful mm. novel, uh, Providence Island. Uh, I grabbed it mm. and went to work on it, and I never did another lick on the novel. Huh. And I, it was just what and, a blessing to be able to and do so it. And so 40 years later, mm -hmm. uh, Harper and Rowe, your original publisher, comes yeah. to you and says <clears throat> what? And they say, uh, Bill, we would like to put out a 40th anniversary, very special edition of the novel. And I said, oh, isn't that wonderful? And then I thought, oh, now there's the answer to the prayer. I get to rewrite the book, not hurt it, mm. not damage it, you know, add lots of new dialogue, stuff and the ending, mm -hmm. a brand new extended, uh, very spooky scene. Oh, yeah. It is for me. But... Uh, you know, mainly doing what a writer does when you know you did another a, you did draft. A, you did you a, another polish, pass. You polish yeah. all. Is, 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 writing is rhythm. Now, do you recommend this to other authors, going back and repairing, tweaking, adding? They all do that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you usually do it, and then you put it away, and that's it. You don't get a chance. Oh, nobody, no. will, usually, nobody comes back they, and asks you to usually republish. Usually do three, four, five drafts mm -hmm. of something, and every time, mm -hmm. you know, it gets better and better. Yeah. Why, well, here, here's a question, and I, this is critical to this. You and I have had many discussions about this book and the rest of your work. Mm. If you read about Bill Blatty in the media or you talk to people who've seen the book or watch the movie, mm. the thing they'll tell you is, boy, that was the scariest thing I've ever encountered. It was that your intention when you wrote this book, to scare the pants off of people? You know, this is why I'm here, right? That, <laughs> that I am hauled out of my burrow. <laughs> Every year at Halloween, as if I were some furless, aging, demonic, punxatawney <laughs> Phil, uh, has, it just brings always a smile of amusement to my lips because mm -hmm. I will now make a humiliating admission. Please believe me that it's true. I have zero recollection when writing the novel, The Exorcist, of any intention to frighten the reader in the slightest. I thought that I, w which you may take, I suppose, mm -hmm. as a mission of failure on a, on a stupefying <laughs> scale, but I thought I was writing a novel of faith, mm -hmm. a, uh, a thrilling, you know, disguised as a thrilling, suspenseful, supernatural mm -hmm. detective story. Yeah. My intention was always apostolic. Meaning what? What did, you hope, what did you want people to, to take away from the book? I wanted to strengthen their faith. This is the, if I may, the, the chronology. Uh, when I was either a sophomore or freshman at Georgetown University, I attended a lecture in Copley Hall on campus. 
by a priest who had come from the Philippines, and uh, he was talking about a reported um, apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary to three little Philippine girls mm-hmm. at, at Lipa in the Philippines, and these were always accompanied by a shower of rose petals bearing an imprint of the Blessed Mother. Mm. Very fine. But he had brought along a glass display case, put it up on the wall at the end of the lecture. We stood in line, you know, and took a look at it. The young man next to me, mm-hmm. Tubby Wowie Carter, <laughs> looked at it, and, you know, and there, on, on every petal, there was an imprint, and they were slightly different, but it was always the Blessed Mother. Mm. And he said, well, what are we waiting for? I puzzled for weeks, if not months, about what Wowie Carter meant by that, and I finally realized he was saying, like the apostles after mm-hmm. the uh, resurrection, let's run out into the streets and evangelize the mm-hmm. world. Then the next year, as a junior, 1949, while in New Testament class, uh, our teacher, Father Eugene Gallagher, started talking about a case of possession and exorcism going on at that time in the neighborhood. And uh, he got a lot of the details wrong, you know. Nevertheless, I thought someday, if someone were able to thoroughly research this case, or demonic possession, and show that it, it's really genuine, I said, what, what a boost to the faith, what mm-hmm. a help to those mm-hmm. millions who were, who were troubled oh. by their faith. I, I, you know, if you'll indulge me, what I'd like you to do is read a little portion of this because uh, quite frankly, I, I was so scared the first time I read it. There aren't I didn't any bad words that. in this. No, 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 I don't think there are any bad words in this. Uh, but it, it, this is uh, a moment near the end of the book where Father Marin, who is the exorcist, uh, and Father Karras, the younger priest, have a discussion. And if you'd indulge us for this in our remaining minutes oh, good. here. When I'm done, ask me who the exorcist is. I will. <clears throat> The priests left the room, stepping into the warmth and the dimness of the hall, where they both leaned wearily against the wall, their heads down and arms folded, as they listened to the eerie, muffled singing of Panius Angelicus from within. Mm. It was Caris who at last broke their silence. You, you said earlier, Father, that there was only one entity we're dealing with. Yes. The hushed tones, the lowered heads were confessional. All the others are but forms of attack, continued Merrin. There is one, only one. It is a demon. There was a silence, then Merrin stated simply, I know you doubt this, but this demon I have met once before, and he is powerful, Damien, powerful. A silence, then Kara spoke again. We say the demon cannot touch the victim's will. Yes, that is so. There is no sin. And Father, what is the purpose of possession? What's the point? Why this little girl? Who can know, answered Marin. Who can really hope to know? And yet I think the demon's target is, is not the possessed. Not this little girl. It is us, the observers, every person in this house. And I think, I think the point is to make us despair, Damien, to reject our own humanity, to see ourselves as ultimately bestial, vile and putrescent, without dignity, ugly, unworthy. Mm. And there lies the heart of it, perhaps, in unworthiness. For I think belief in God is not a matter of reason at all. I think it finally is a matter of love, of accepting the possibility that God could ever love us. Marin paused and continued more slowly and with an air of introspection. Again, who really knows? But it's clear, at least to me, that the demon knows where to strike. Oh, oh yes, he knows. Long ago, I despaired of ever loving my neighbor. Certain people repelled me. And so how could I love them, I thought. It tormented me, Damien. It led me to despair of myself 
And from that, very soon, to despair of my God, my faith was shattered. Surprised, Karis turned and looked at Merrin with interest. And what happened? Ah, oh, well, at last I realized that God would never ask of me that which I know to be psychologically impossible, that the love which he asked was in my will and not meant to be felt as emotion. No, no, not at all. He was asking that I act with love, that I do unto others, and that I should do it unto those who repelled me, I believe, was a greater act of love than any other. Merrin lowered his head and spoke even more softly. I know all of this must seem very obvious to you, Damien. I know. But at the time, I couldn't see it. Strange blindness. How many husbands and wives must believe they have fallen out of love because their hearts no longer race at the sight of their beloveds? Ah, yeah. oh, dear God. And then he nodded. There it lies, I think, Damien. Possession. Not in wars, as some tend to believe. No, not so much. And very rarely in extraordinary interventions such as here, this girl, this poor child. No. No, I tend to see possession most often in the little things, in the senseless petty spites and misunderstandings, the cruel and cutting word that leaps unbidden to the tongue between friends, between lovers, between husbands and wives. Enough of these, and we have no need of Satan to manage our wars. Mm. These we manage for ourselves. Mm. For ourselves. You once said that you wanted to write a sermon no one could fall to asleep to. Is uh, that what you consider this master? That is here? exactly why uh, I cloaked the story in, in the guise of an exciting page turner, mm -hmm. a suspense novel. That supernatural detective story. Mm -hmm. It was made to lure you, so you couldn't stop turning the pages. Yes, it's the, it was the equivalent, my intention, of giving you a sermon you mm -hmm. couldn't possibly sleep through. I didn't know that terror would be the right. agent. Did, and, and I imagine <laughs> you did. I thought it was suspense. And did you know that you were, <laughs> opening, up, <laughs> you were opening up a whole new genre? I mean, this, no. this book has been so copied, and the movie that followed, so I, copied so many times, many times poorly, I, and without the spiritual center that holds this I together. I had no idea. I thought, all right, I'm going to write it. I hope to God I can. I don't know if I can put together a page, a paragraph, even a sentence without a smile or a laugh in it somewhere, but I'm going to try. And my highest ambition was that it be respectfully received, hmm. respectfully reviewed. Not, uh, well, yeah, this is a new comic novel by Blatty. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you at least got that and much, much more. Oh, Tell me, were you, um, does that make you at all upset all these years later that people misread your intention? Or do you think that original intention has uh, had an effect on readers, whether I, they I realize it or not? I think it absolutely does did because I was once a public relations director at Loyola University of Los Angeles, so I knew many of the Jesuits there, and mm -hmm. several of them told me after the release of the novel that they had never experienced such a thundering herd coming down on the confessional box <laughs> as <laughs> after, after the, the release of this the, book. The, wow. the, this was written. I was a little sad because it ended my comedy writing career. Final quick question, yes. and you, uh, I, I'm sad it broke your comedy writing career because A Shot in the Dark is still my favorite oh, movie ever you. and hilarious. Thank Who you. is the exorcist? Very quickly. It's really Karis. His exorcism oh. was through an act of love, giving up his life for this little girl whom he had never actually met. Mm, interesting. Only the demon was his contact. Mm. 
William Peter Blatty, thanks for being oh, here. My it's pleasure. always a joy. Thanks. Oh, my pleasure. The 40th anniversary edition of The Exorcist is available at bookstores everywhere and online. It is every bit the page turner it was in 1971, and even more, there's those extra scenes, and they are creepy <laughs> and insightful. Finally, I've received many confused emails concerning the Reforming International Finance and Monetary Systems document released by the Vatican this week. But one email sort of captured the spirit of the others. Violet wrote, please suggest to His Holiness Pope Benedict that he had better not alienate the Tea Party members by stating that he agrees with the Occupy Wall Street upstarts. Well, after reading this, and for the sake of Violet, so many others, let's cut to the chase. First of all, despite the headlines you may have seen this week, the Pope takes on Wall Street, Vatican calls for Central World Bank, I'm here to tell you it is not true. If anyone took the time to watch the press conference preceding the release of this international financial systems document, the papal spokesman, Father Federico Lombardi, was pretty explicit when he said the document was, quote, not in any way the opinion of the Pope. Later, Bishop Mario Tosso, the secretary of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, which released the paper, said the Pope didn't even read the document, but the Secretary of State had approved its release. So the idea that the Pope is advocating anything, especially a global economic hegemon to rule the world markets, is a stretch. One might wish the press got this excited when the Pope actually spoke out about those things he is infallible on, namely faith and morals. So what is all this exactly? It is the work of a small Vatican congregation, the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace, which has released a document for policymakers headed to the G20 meeting next month in Cannes. In fact, in the introduction to the document, it plainly says, these are possible paths to follow in line with church teaching. Possible paths, not mandates, not absolutes, but possible paths. A good deal of the document is spent decrying utilitarian economic approaches and urging a moral and ethical financial framework to rescue the world. Then comes the suggestion of a supranational authority to regulate the world's economy. The problem is so vast and globalism so advanced the document suggests that only a supranational financial authority can bring order. Now, here's where things get hairy. To implement this proposal, according to the document, governments would be required to, quote, transfer part of each nation's powers to a world authority and to regional authorities. Now, this idealized World Bank would seek to advance, quote, the world's common good. This seems overly optimistic, if not naive. Given the track record of these extra national organizations like the UN, the EU, the World Bank, to expect a new body to suddenly restore order could well require a miracle. Far from seeking the global common good, these groups are often more plagued by corruption and become instruments of, which are often used to force the will of elites upon weaker member states. The document rightly mentions the church's teaching on subsidiarity which requires that higher authorities only offer their aid when people nearest the ground, i.e. local governments, can't do the job. While it's wonderful that the authors cited subsidiarity, it's hard to see how that squares with the super World Bank proposal. I spoke to a number of people this week in finance. None of them saw any way that a plan like this could ever come to pass, given the diversity of the world financial markets and if a tiny area like Europe can't find a one-size-fits-all solution, what chance does the entire world have of finding one? So in the end, there's no reason for alarm or hyperventilation. This document is just what it claims to be, a reflection by theologians on a very complex area of society. Their suggestions are subject to what is called prudential judgment, meaning it's up to each of us, using right reason and moral principles to evaluate this reflection and come to our own conclusions. And Violet, the Pope is not siding with the Occupy Wall Street people or the Tea Party or anybody else. He's siding, as he always does, with humanity. And in this case, he said nothing at all. For all the hoopla being created by this document, it has no teaching authority, and the Pope didn't write it. 
Well, that's all the time we have. I've placed a good number of articles further exploring this financial reflection by the Vatican congregation on my Facebook page. You can find it at RaymondArroyo.com. It's on the left-hand side. That link will take you through. Until next week, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye now. Thanks again, Bill.